Hi, I'm Rob D. I'm here with Rob B. And this is a Property Hub University course on how to flip a property. It certainly is. So let's have a look at what you'll learn. We're going to have a look at who flipping is right for, and just as importantly, who it's not. We're going to make up what makes a property flippable. We're going to give you three ways to find a property to flip. Then we're going to dig into the numbers, and we'll show you how to finance your flip, survive the process, and live to tell the tale while maximizing your sales price and profit. Yeah, loads to get through. So let's get into it and start really importantly with who flipping is for. Flipping is broadly appropriate for two main types of people. Firstly, it's for people who want to make lumps of cash. So if you hold a property to rent out, that's great because you get income coming in every month, but you don't get a load of income in one go. So if you want to make a whole load of money, hopefully in one go, then flipping is for you. It's also for people who've got a finite amount of cash and want to extend that cash as far as they possibly can into building a big portfolio. So quite a popular strategy is flip one, hold one. So you'll flip a property, you'll then use the profit from that to put down as a deposit on a buy to let, and then go and flip again and repeat the process over and over. That way, as long as everything goes well, you don't end up in a position where you completely run out of cash to build your portfolio with. So that's who flipping is for. But who is it not for? Well, it's not for people who don't like risk. Because flipping can generate large sums of funds, but things can go wrong too, and in a big way. So if you're the type of person who gets bothered by things easily, loses sleep at night, well, maybe flipping's not for you. But if you're unsure on what is for you, make sure you check out our course on choosing the right strategy, which is also provided by Property Hub University for free. Let's take a look now at the basic model for flipping a property. And the good news is it's extremely simple. You'll probably be familiar with it already. Basically, you buy a property for an amount of money and that property has some kind of problem with it. You then solve that problem, which involves a further cost. And then you sell that property into a new market at a price that's higher than the amount you spent on buying it and solving the problem. Incredibly simple. And that's one of the attractions of flipping. Typically, that involves buying a rundown property doing the work that's required to get it into move-in condition and then selling it on to an owner-occupier who doesn't want to do the work. They want something that's perfect right away. It doesn't have to be like that. It can involve extending a property, turning it from one type of property into another, or even solving a legal problem. But what you'll be familiar with from shows like Homes Under the Hammer is normally the refurb model. Getting that work done, making it look fantastic and sell it on to an owner-occupier. Well, the great news is we've got a real-life example of what a flip could look like. And it's Rob Dees. He has successfully undertaken a flip in Hull. So Rob, talk us through it. Yeah, so this is a property that I bought after auction, didn't sell at auction, picked it up afterwards for 115000 And it had some structural work that needed done to it. I think that's what put most people off buying this property. So sourced out the structural work and also completely refurbished it inside. It was looking kind of okay-ish, but a bit tired. It wasn't going to appeal to most first-time buyers. So completely refurbished it internally. That cost £23,500. I used a combination of cash and bridging finance to raise the funds to buy the property and do that work and ended up selling it for 172000 to a first-time buyer. So this is a pretty typical example of what you'd expect your average flip to look like. Buy at auction, do it up, bring it back up to scratch, and then sell it to a first-time buyer. So after I deducted the finance costs as well as all the others, the profit of that came to just under £26,000. A very healthy profit indeed. Well done, Mr D. Well, the good news is, in the next part of the course, we'll teach you how to find properties like this to flip. Now, cement your learning by taking the quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. So you've decided that flipping is a strategy for you. Well, the first step then is to actually find a suitable property. So let's have a look at what to look for. We'll always be thinking about the end product. Who are you flipping to? You need to make sure your project appeals to that type of person. Yeah, the dream result if you're flipping a property is to end up with a bidding war. If you've got multiple parties who are interested in buying it, they're going to bid each other up and up, and that means that your profit gets bigger and bigger. For that reason, you want the property to be appealing, you want people to fall in love with it, and one way to maximise your chances of getting that bidding war is to end up with a property that appeals to both first and second time buyers. It's just common sense. The bigger your target market, the more likely you are to get multiple people who all want to get their hands on it. Absolutely. So you'll want to look for an area with strong owner-occupier demand. 
So you should be targeting areas where people want to live. They should desire to live in the areas you're looking to flip in. If it's a not so desirable area and people only live there because they have to, it's not ideal for a flip. So make sure you're confident that's a desirable area. And it's an active area. And what I mean by active is the properties are bought and sold on a frequent basis. Some parts of the UK, the property market is a little sleepy, and that is not great for flips. So you want to make sure that's a buoyant market in the area you're looking to operate in. Now, you can do this by speaking to local estate agents and checking on Supla and Right Move to see how long properties are taking to sell and how long properties have been left on the shelf for. Just seeing properties listed doesn't mean it's a popular market. If they've been on for months, or in some cases, even years, it might be that area isn't that active. So make sure you do your research. Let's look now at a few ways of finding a property that meets those criteria. So the first way is the most obvious. It's estate agents. Estate agents have got the majority of properties that are for sale at any time on their books. Therefore, that's an obvious place to go. The bad news is because it's obvious that's where everyone else is going to be looking as well. So chances are you're going to end up getting outbid quite a lot of the time just because there are lots of people looking for this type of property. That doesn't mean that getting properties to flip through estate agents doesn't work, but it does mean that it's a numbers game. Chances are you're going to have to look at a lot of properties to find one that works and that you can secure at the right price. It also means you're going to have to be in a position to go and view it immediately because the right properties, the best properties, aren't going to stick around. If it goes live on a Monday and you're waiting to the weekend to see it, chances are you'll have missed out. And the final thing to keep in mind when buying through estate agents is to always follow up. We say it all the time, but people still don't always do it. And that is going to cost you opportunities. A third of sales fall through after an offer is accepted. That means if you see something that you really, really like, but somebody ends up beating you to it, keep following up. Do it every week until you hear that the property has actually exchanged and it's definitely going through. I can guarantee that you'll end up getting your best deal second time round rather than straight away. Another way you may be able to find a flip is through an auction. Auctions can prove a great hunting ground for good deals, but they can also be a place where you overpay for a nightmare property. So always view the property and do your sums first. Make sure you check the legal pack because sometimes the property may look like a great prospect, but hidden in the legals is something nasty or something unexpected. So make sure you get a competent and trusted solicitor to check over the details before you go bidding. Now, of course, you can wait to the live auction itself and try your luck there, but often The best time to get involved in an auction is either way before the auction itself, trying to take the property off the market and do a deal early on, which many auction houses are willing to do if the price is right. Or alternatively, you may be able to get yourself a great deal after the auction. If a property hasn't sold, it doesn't mean it's a bad property. It may be that people have overlooked it for the wrong reasons, or it just needs that a bit more time spent on it to make sure It's an attractive deal. The great thing about post-auction, you're not under quite as much pressure and you have time to do your research and clear up any issues that property may have. So whether you're bidding live, getting in early or getting in after the auction, auctions are definitely one to consider. A third way of finding that property to flip is going direct to the vendor. In other words, cutting out the middleman, whether that's an auction or an estate agent, going straight to the owner and finding out if they want to sell. There are a few different ways that you can do this. So if you've got landlords in your network who are pretty tired of being a landlord, they're looking to sell up and bank their profit. If they've got a property that they might be using as a rental now, but would work well as an owner occupier, if you give it a bit of work, that could be one potential way of finding your flip. Alternatively, if you've got a particular target area where you know that it ticks the boxes, it's desirable, properties are moving fast, it appeals to first and second time buyers, then you could go and leaflet houses in that area. And there are lots of other forms of local marketing you can do, whether that's adverts in shops or billboards or driving around in a car with your phone number on the side. Generally, it's about putting your message out there and keeping your ear to the ground. If estate agents is the easiest and most obvious way of getting stock with the most competition, going direct is the least obvious and it has the least competition. But it is difficult for the simple reason that most people won't be looking to sell or won't be looking to sell right now. So going direct can get you the best results, but it's something you need to really commit to. You can't expect to just put out a couple of hundred leaflets and get a result. It takes time. You need to stick with it. But if you're willing to do that, it can be a great way of finding the right property. 
Yes, finding a deal through any avenue is all about perseverance. It's a numbers game. Don't expect your first offer on your first property to be a winner. You might be lucky, but you might go through dozens of offers before you get to your first deal. Don't worry, that's normal. Good deals don't fall on your lap. You have to put the work in to get them. So don't be disheartened if you find it difficult to get a deal. Keep trying, keep putting the effort in, and remember the tips we've given you, and it will eventually come good for you. And remember, the heavier the refurb, or more complex the legals on a project, means there'll be less competition. So if you're willing to be that bit braver, where others might not go, you'll find there's less people chasing the same deal as you. In the next part of the course, we're going to look at the financials. Now cement your learning by taking a quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. Right, so you found a property that you think might just be the one. How then do you work out whether it's going to work as a flip or not? Well, this is where you have to get into the financials, such a critical part of the process. So here are just some of the costs to consider. You're going to have your legal costs, like you'll pay your solicitor to purchase and then eventually sell the property. You've got to include stamp duty. Yes, unfortunately so, but you do need to price that in. You'll have your finance costs. If you're buying cash, of course that won't apply, but if you're using any external finance, you'll need to price that in. The refurb itself. Make sure you put that into your costings and include a contingency. The staging of the property, making it look all pretty to attract a buyer. You'll need to price that in too. And if it doesn't go as quick as you'd like, make sure you account for any holding costs, such as council tax, electricity, and things like that. So those are the costs that you're going to have to account for. The biggest cost that you're going to encounter is the cost of actually buying the property in the first place. And this is absolutely critical, paying the right amount for the property in the first place. This is what, to a large extent, the success or failure of your project is going to hinge on. The way to work out how much to pay is to work backwards. Work back from the price that you expect to sell for at the end and just apply a really simple equation. So take the price that you expect to sell the property for, deduct the costs of doing your refurb along with all the other costs that we just talked about, then deduct the profit that you want to make and what you're left with is the maximum that you can afford to pay for the property. So don't start from what the seller wants for the property. Forget all that. Work back from the end. Once you know the sale price, you can deduct everything else, including your profit margin, and end up with your maximum purchase price. Now, something you might be asking yourself is, well, what should my profit margin be? And of course, that's a very personal answer for you. But what the professionals typically work to is a 20% profit margin. They do that because that's a realistic return to get. And it doesn't mean that things are too tight. If you're going for 10% and then a few things go wrong that you weren't expecting, you could end up making no money at all or even making a loss. 20% is a healthy number to expect. But if you do get your numbers a bit wrong or things don't turn out as expected, you still come out ahead. This might just be the most important point of the entire course. Working out how much to pay and not overpaying is absolutely critical. If you overpay for the property in the first place, you're giving yourself a massive uphill struggle because that's the part you can control. You can't control to the same degree how much it's going to cost you to do the refurb or how much you can sell it for, but you do have control over the purchase price. If you get yourself a great price, everything else is a lot easier. But if you overpay, then you're going to be fighting against that the whole way through the project. So. How do you work out what the sale price should be? Well, start off by looking for comparables. So you'll be looking for properties nearby that are very similar and have sold recently. Remember, you should be looking for an active market, so that shouldn't be hard to do. You can use Rightmove's sold house prices section and go within quarter of a mile radius to get an idea of what your type of property will go for. But remember, do not be over-optimistic. This is a common mistake people new to flipping make, is they get excited and start to kid themselves. Something that we refer to as deal bias. You look at your deal and you see it in its absolute best light. Do not do this. Try and go the other way and be as cautious as possible when assessing a sale price. Because if you get it wrong, it'll cost you big time. Remember, you can cut costs, you can reduce the purchase price, but you cannot change the price the market is willing to change for your property, no matter how much you love it personally. And it's worth bearing in mind that sometimes you will get outbid by someone who hasn't done their sums as well as you. And it is frustrating, but it's unavoidable. 
They're one of those amateurs who've got a bit too excited about the deal potential. Don't fall into that trap. So that's how you work out how much you should be paying. Now, of course, you've got to reach into your pocket and actually pay for it. And it's important to know how you can and can't do that. The most important thing to know about financing a flip is that you can't use a mortgage. Most of the time, a mortgage is going to take too long to arrange anyway, but no lender is going to be happy. First of all, lending you money on a property that's probably not ready to be moved into. And secondly, lending it to you for potentially only a few months. That's just not what mortgages are for. They're a long-term form of finance. So if you can't use a mortgage, what can you do? Well, the best option, if you have it, is cash. It sounds simple. You might think that there's a more complicated answer to this, but no, cash, if you've got it, is the best option. It means you can move quickly, it gives you certainty, and it doesn't cost you anything other than the opportunity cost of what you'd be doing with that cash instead. If you don't have the cash, then you could potentially use someone else's cash. That's what in property is commonly called a joint venture. It's where somebody who's got the cash teams up with somebody who's got the experience or the ability to execute the project and they work together. This can work, but it needs to be approached very carefully. When you're working with someone else in a stressful situation and there's lots of money involved, things can go wrong. So it might sound like a really good idea to work with a friend or a family member, but make sure you put a great deal of thought into it because if things don't go perfectly, things can unravel very, very quickly. Now, if you don't have the cash and you don't want to work with someone else who does, even though you can't use a mortgage, there is another option. And that option is bridging finance. Now, with bridging finance, you can expect to pay anything from 8 to 15%. Plus, you'll pay 2% to 3% in fees, which will make up part of the arrangement fee. There are some lenders who will lend you the refurb funds too. Now, make sure you dig into the detail when you do bridging finance, because no deal is the same. Some charge interest paid at the start, some at the end, or it can even be monthly. So make sure you really understand what you're doing. And if you are new to this, please work with a good broker. They will be worth their weight in gold to explain to you all the costings and help break it down. They'll probably also be able to show you bridging finance that you didn't know was out there. So make sure you work with a good broker. And we've already said, but remember to factor in all the costs into your calculations. Finance is part of your refurb. So don't ignore it. It will be one of the bigger costs of your project and you have to account for it. Now, cement your learning by taking the quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. Of course, the biggest and most important stage of flipping a property is actually the refurb itself. The work that you're doing to transform it from a tired, rundown property into a desirable home that people are going to be fighting over. This is a stage that a lot of people find daunting and there's a lot to take into account. But don't worry, we've got lots of advice to help you through it. So first up, let's look at preparation. Go out and get three sets of quotes from tradespeople before you buy. You don't want to rely on your first quote. It could be a great quote, it could be an awful one, but without getting a few in, you're never going to know. Next, start engaging with estate agents and use their local expertise to guide you on the best use of the property. So the type of layout, the specification that will be required to attract a sale. They will know this if they're any good. So make sure you speak to several of them. Now, when you work with your chosen builder, a key piece of advice, and please take this one on board, is to arrange a fixed price quote with your chosen builder. You can run up some big costs if they just price it as they go. And there have been many a nightmare story where people haven't fixed their costs. And you've also got to decide whether you're going to use one building firm to run the whole project for you, or will you employ individual trades that should make it cheaper if you do your job right, but it will require more work, so you have to weigh up that trade off. Now, a big part of preparation, which is also going to play into the cost of your refurb, is getting the specification right. All refurbs are not the same. You could do it to a super duper high luxury standard, or you could just do the bare minimum, and there's lots of things in between. The way to get this right is to know the market that you're selling into and spend money where it counts. If you don't do that, If you base it on the property that you would want to live in, or you do it based on cost and you just want to get it done as cheaply as you possibly can, you're going to get it wrong. You're either going to end up spending too much money, which is going to reduce your profit, or you're going to have a property that isn't up to scratch and therefore no one's going to want to buy it at the price you want to charge. By working with estate agents and getting to know the local market, you'll know how much you need to spend and you'll be able to target that money in the right place. 
It might be that people in that area really care about having a really great kitchen. If that's the case, that's where you spend your money because that's where they're going to be looking. There are some general rules on the spec that apply to pretty much all refurbs. The first of those is to keep it neutral. So it sounds boring, but white walls and beige carpet with one feature wall to liven things up, you can't go too far wrong with. It makes it look clean, it makes it look new, and it means that buyers can put their own stamp on it and can imagine themselves looking there. It's not going to alienate anyone with really specific taste. Another trick is to, in the kitchen, not have any wall cupboards, just have base units. This achieves two things. Firstly, it saves money. And secondly, it makes the kitchen look bigger. So especially if it's not a large space, this can work really nicely. Of course, if the buyer does want to put those in, they can do, and it's not going to put them off. But when they're first looking around, it's going to make the kitchen look a lot bigger without them. And a final tip on the spec is to limit the tiles that you use in the kitchen and the bathroom. Fully tiled bathrooms, for example, can look brilliant, but it costs a lot of money. So if you need to keep the spec high because that's what the area demands, then that's what you'll have to do. But otherwise, keep it to a minimum and it'll really keep your costs down without putting too many people off. Okay, so let's look at the process you'll go through. So as it's a refurb, chances are you're going to be ripping a lot of stuff out. So it might be old kitchens, it might be heating, it might be the majority of the property. But one thing's for sure, you're going to be getting a lot of stuff out of there so you can get stuff in. So rip out is your first step. Then you'll go into the structural build. So you may have a property that needs little or no restructuring, but if it's a bigger project, you're adding an extension or there's something wrong with the current structure, the biggest and often most expensive part of the process is the structural build. If it is a bigger project, then you'll need to get the property watertight, which is, is exactly like it sounds. You wanna make sure the property isn't gonna get drenched when it rains. So that means getting it all dry so the internal works can start. It's a key milestone in any refurb project. Once you are watertight, you can start what's called the first fix. And this will involve things like electrics and plumbing. So you may be rewiring, you may be putting a new heating system in. It will all depend on the size of your project, but most refurbs will involve a first fix. Once your first fix is complete, well then you get to the second fix. And that's just where the project's moved on a little bit. So you've got all the plumbing in, so you put the bathroom in. You install appliances. Your property's really starting to look like a home at this stage. But it won't look like a home that's going to sell until you decorate it. Don't cut corners here. Yes, you want to do it at a good price, but as we've already discussed, the specification will go a long way to selling your property. Now, unless you are supremely skilled, you're going to have to work with tradespeople throughout this process. You might choose to do some of the work yourself, you might not, but chances are you're going to be getting in at least an electrician or a plumber, or maybe you're going to have a building firm doing everything. Whoever you're working with, it's your job to keep the project running smoothly. The first step to doing that is actually setting things up properly in the first place. So start by getting really clear on the timeline. Understand how long each part of the job is going to take and who needs to come in when. What are all the dependencies? What needs to be done before the next part of the job can start? Map all that out and make sure that you build in a buffer because things are never going to run perfectly. Whether it's a key person not turning up or materials being out of stock or weather issues, something will always go wrong. So make sure that your timeline gives you some wiggle room and is realistic. Getting that agreed in the first place is really important, but that's not the end of the job. If you expect to go away and leave everyone to it and come back in eight weeks to see a finished project, you are going to be very disappointed. It's critical that you keep checking in throughout. At least weekly, you or somebody who you nominate needs to be going on site and seeing what's going on and making sure that there are no problems and that everything is going as it should. If you don't seem that bothered about whether things get finished, well, then you're just going to drop further and further down the list of priorities and it's going to take longer than it needs to be. So don't be a complete pest. Don't hover over people's shoulders when they're trying to work, but do keep checking in. And a really important part of keeping your tradespeople motivated is, surprisingly enough, to pay them. Pay them regularly and pay them promptly. Agree a payment schedule in advance and stick to it. If you agree to pay them weekly, then do that. Do it consistently on the same day of the week for the work that they've done in that time. If you agree to pay them when a certain milestone has been hit, then make sure that you inspect the property to make sure that it has been completed to your satisfaction. But once you do that, pay straight away. A really easy way to keep your trades happy is to be a good payer. But don't fall into the trap of paying ahead. Only pay for work that's actually been done, whether that's on the basis of time or milestones. But if your trace people start asking to get paid ahead of time, unless there's a really good reason and it's for a particular materials, don't do it. 
If they've already got the money, they're going to be less motivated to turn up and actually do the work. The final step before you sell your property is to stage it. A small investment here can be the big difference between buyers and a bidding war. It really has the potential to make that much of an impact. Homeowners buy with emotion. So get them emotional about your property by showing it off in its best light. Now, you can buy basic furniture to do this, but there are also companies out there that will rent you really nice furniture packages for this purpose in mind. So weigh up both. If you're doing this on a regular basis, then you may want to invest in some furniture that you put into storage after each and every project. Or if this is just an occasional thing for you, then maybe renting the furniture pack may be a better option. Look into both and make a decision. Before any viewings take place, make sure the property is spotless. It really does make a difference. Dust left over from the builders isn't a good look. So make sure it's professionally cleaned or you scrub it yourself before anybody comes round. Again, buyers will notice and it will impact the way they feel about your property. There is really no limit you can go to. Some people go as far as putting cushions in, pictures on the walls, curtains, blinds, and even crockery in the kitchen. It's up to you to what level you go, but don't go too sparse because it won't look good. Commit to doing it well and you'll reap the rewards. And once you've done all this, you get to the fun bit, the sale, which is what we'll cover next. Now cement your learning by taking a quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. So you found the perfect property to flip. You've done all the hard work of the refurb and it's looking fantastic. It might feel like your job is done, but it's not. You have not successfully flipped a property until you've actually sold it. This is not a part of the process to ease off because there's a lot you can do to get that sale through quickly and maximise the price that you achieve. So before it's listed, there's a few things to do. You may want to consider paying for professional photos once the property is staged. Yes, you'd like to think your estate agent should do a good job of that. And some will. And if you've got confidence that your estate agent's going to take great photos, then fantastic. Just go with them. But there are some people who flip property who like to employ a specialist who's used to taking pictures in properties to show it off in the best light. It's up to you which way you go, but do not accept poor images from your estate agent and make that very clear from the outset. And that conversation should take place before you appoint them. By this point, you should have some agents in mind. You should have engaged with them already throughout this process and get a feel for who's the most impressive. Once you've picked the best of the bunch, don't knock them down on price. Often you'll hear you can negotiate on agents' fees, and you can. But do you want them to be motivated to sell your property? Absolutely. So if they know they're going to earn full fees on your property, the chances are they're going to put maximum effort into getting it gone. So hopefully your agent is motivated, but you'll still need to work with them and manage them like you would any member of your team. If you just hand it over and you never get in touch again, they're not going to be as motivated as they are to sell the property of the vendor who's phoning them up every five minutes asking for an update. So you don't have to be that annoying, but you should definitely be calling at least every week and finding out where they're up to. If you can, visit the office in person. Agents spend their whole day being hounded on the phone. If you can actually turn up and meet them face to face, they're just naturally going to work harder for you because they're going to feel more of a connection. When you do speak to them, insist on getting feedback from any viewings that have happened. So don't just let them fob you off by saying, oh yeah, there are three viewings and they all really liked it. We'll wait and see if anything happens. Get specific feedback on what was said. There are two reasons for doing that. One is that that feedback might be valuable. There might be something that keeps coming up that's easy for you to address that otherwise would put people off. And the earlier in the process you can find out about that, the more productive future viewings will be and the better job the agent will be able to do. The other reason is that you might not have priced the property correctly or the market might have changed since you originally set your price. It's really important to listen to what the market is saying. If it drags on for a while and it hasn't sold, agents will start suggesting cutting the price because that's the obvious thing to do. By getting feedback, you'll know if that's really the objection or if there's something else going on. But if a price cut is the way forward, then don't be too stubborn about protecting your profit. That's why it's important to have some margin in there to make sure that you can cut the price if you need to and still make money. Cutting the price is far better than having an unsold property. Remember, until you sell it, you've got nothing. All the profit comes at the end when the deal is actually done. 
You can be as stubborn as you like that it's worth a certain amount and you're the only one who loses out if the market feels otherwise. Hopefully, though, you'll have priced it right and the agent will have done their job and you will have plenty of offers. If you do have multiple offers to choose between, that is brilliant. That is absolutely ideal. Now, those offers won't all be the same. Some will be higher than others, but there's more to it than just the price. For example, if one person needs to sell their property before they can buy or they've already agreed a sale, but they're part of a long chain, then there's risk in there for you. There might be another offer that comes in lower, but they're ready to move straight away. If that's the case, you need to decide what's important to you. Is it the highest price or is it the fastest sale? Especially if you're using finance, it's going to cost you money for every week that goes by until the property is sold. So look beyond just the price and choose the offer that seems the strongest on the whole. Remember when the offer's in and the sale's agreed, the work isn't done. It's still got to go through conveyancing. That's working with the solicitor and getting the property exchanged and complete. If you have paperwork to fill in, fill it promptly. Do not sit on it. You don't want the deal to fall over because things have taken too long. Another way of making sure your deal doesn't drag is chasing your solicitor weekly. And I mean chase. Solicitors, unfortunately, in conveyancing, are known not for being the quickest of workers. So by being that person, yes, you want to be that person who calls up every single week for an update on what's going on, they are far more likely to prioritise you and your work, especially if they think they're going to see regular work from you. And remember, it goes without saying, but be polite. You can push hard, but just be polite with it. If they like you, it's going to make life a lot easier. So finally, after all that hard work, you are done. You have flipped a property. Congratulations. It's certainly been hard work, but hopefully the profit at the end hitting your bank account will make it all worthwhile. If this is just an occasional thing for you or you decided that actually it's just too stressful, then maybe that's it. Maybe you just wait until the next opportunity comes along that's too good for you to ignore. But if this is going to be a business for you, then it's important to be thinking about your next project well before the first one is finished. As you'll know from going through the process, it takes time to find the right property. It takes time to go through the process of buying it. So if you're relying on making an income from this, whether that's for you or to build your portfolio, you can't really have months go by without any projects going on. So always being looking and having the next one lined up is really important. There's also a lot to learn from each project. And a really valuable thing to do is when you get to the end, have a sit down and think about what you could do better next time around. There's going to be lessons to learn from every single project. Every project is different. You're never going to get it perfect, but there are always things that you can do better next time. So sit down and cast your mind back over how things went and note down anything that you could learn from to make your life easier next time round. As you go along, you're going to learn lessons, you're going to build your team, you're going to find the right people to work with, and you're going to end up with materials that you can use over and over again, whether that's recycling the same spec, so you've always got the tin of paint that's the right colour, or whether it's your staging kit that you're keeping in storage and moving between properties. Unless you're highly unusual, you won't find your first flip to be particularly easy. But because you're always building your knowledge, you're building your team, and you're having some of the materials in place already, it does get easier. So that's it. If you've worked through every single part of this course, you'll now know how to successfully flip a property. As you can see, it takes a lot of work and shouldn't be taken up lightly. But if you've got the time and the commitment, We've just given you the knowledge. So good luck if you decide to take on a project. And if you're still unsure on whether it's the right strategy for you, then make sure you check out our other free course from Property Hub University on choosing the right strategy. Hopefully you think these courses are great, but taking action is where the real magic happens. But best of luck on whatever property journey you decide to take. Now, just take the final quiz and collect your badge for completing this course. Then get started on another one.